Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, Ad Nauseam listeners, to episode 37. As always, my name is David Noe. I'm here in the Vomitorium with my good friend and co-host, Dr. Jeff Winkle. How are you, Jeff? I'm feeling great. It's beautiful weather. I'm wearing my Ad Nauseam t-shirt. Wow. So how could it be? How could it be better? You're representing. I am. And it is gorgeous outside, yes. sitting here beside the lake, the blue sky and the sunshine glinting off the surface of the water. The swans gliding across the It's incredible. Lake. It's very nice. Yeah. So no more complaining about the smarchy Michigan weather. Until next week. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. So yeah. we got a shout out this week, don't we, Jeff? You want to give that? Sure. Our shout out this week goes to Paul Prezia. Yeah. He is a Latin teacher at Gregory the Great Academy, which is close to Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, where he lives with his wife. And his two children. Yeah, so far two children, he says. So far, it sounds like he's he wants some more. I think so, right. Yeah. And he, uh, in his correspondence, he left us this little nugget. He said, uh, tell them I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania, quote, with or without a joke about the office. Oh, it's the home of Dunder Mifflin. It is, yeah. as well as Joe Biden, right? Oh, see, he's from Scranton. He That's is right. from Scranton. Did you, do you have an office joke? I, was, I don't. I was, if you were going to give the shout out and you had said, Paul Pretzi is a Latin teacher, I was going to interrupt you with a Dwight Schrute false. <laughs> but I didn't have anything on the other side of that. So, yeah. Bears beats... <laughs> Battles galore, <laughs> right. something like that. Right, right, right. Because we're dealing with the Odyssey today. We are. All right. Yep. But thanks, Paul, for listening. Yes, and thanks for uh, keeping the torch lit, teaching those young minds Latin and so forth out at uh, Gregory the Great Academy. We're so grateful for that. Indeed. And Dave, you have a quote to start us off today. I do. The opening quote is from a very famous classical scholar, C.M. Baura. C.M. Baura. I don't know what the C or the M stand for. Something important, no doubt. But this was written in 1938, uh, published by Duckworth. The title of the work is simply Homer. It's a wonderful introduction. This comes from page 138. The quote's a little bit long, but it's rich. So here we go. In general, the Odyssey lacks the sustained splendor of the Iliad, has fewer overwhelming moments, and a less demanding conception of human worth. The slaughter of the suitors provides a thrilling climax, but lacks the profound pathos of the death of Hector, while the cold, vengeful anger of Odysseus is not comparable to the fiery, devouring passion of Achilles. All is set in a lower key, and this may be due to the nature of the subject and the traditional treatment of it. Folk tales and fairy tales, even tales of injured wives and revengeful husbands, need not summon the same powers as the wounded pride of Achilles or the fate of Troy. The Odyssey has moments of breathless excitement and moving pathos, but its normal level is less stirring and closer to ordinary experience. Even if tradition was partly responsible for setting this tone, there may be an additional reason for it in the poet's desire to compose a poem nearer to the life that he knew and to the events of every day. By combining these with impossible adventures and enthralling marvels, he could set them in a new and brighter light. Longinus thinks that this difference between the Iliad and the Odyssey is due to the poet's advancing years. You referred to that uh, before, that, yes. that the, the Odyssey is kind of a, a late career right. poem of, of Homer, which is a really interesting idea. Yeah, I find it really persuasive. Yeah, uh, Maybe these are stereotypes, uh, most of which I think have at least a, a tiny grain of truth. But a young man filled with passion and fire, a young poet coming out on the stage like Homer, he writes the Iliad. Uh, it has a depth of rage and feeling that the Odyssey can't match. Yeah. I think that Bauer is correct about this. On the other hand, as we've said many times in this series, and we're at the end of it now, the Odyssey is a domestic epic. Yes, it's, right. It's not about suffering, it's about character. So every 15 lines, someone is eating or someone is weeping. Mm -hmm. We're going to see both of those in today's episode as well. That's right. And if, uh, will you allow me to use a, another annoying uh, French phrase? Oh, please. So, uh, compared to the Iliad, the Odyssey is, is more of a roman éclé. Right? Oh. It, it's a story that's... What now? A roman éclé. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it's that a, a kind of a pastry? It is. Yeah, it's, it's very tasty. But it's, right. it's also a story that's 
um, reflective of, of real life. So I think as Deborah was he's saying here, the Odyssey is more relatable hmm. as a story because of the, uh, these domestic settings and um, the food. The, the Iliad is a, a more kind of removed tragedy mm-hmm. that I think is maybe less relatable. But I think he's definitely onto something when Achilles is raging. He's raging not just because he's you know, horrified and reacting to the death of Patroclus. He, it's an existential crisis. He yes. knows he's going to die. Well, and right? it's, everything is a personal insult mm-hmm. to his arete, to his honor. So at the ep- the end of the episode today, we're going to bring in our friend Werner Jaeger mm-hmm. again with oh, yes. a, a little quote about arete and uh, how Homeric heroes viewed themselves with respect to others. Uh, but I think you're exactly right about Achilles is raging about his pending death mm-hmm. and also his wounded sense of honor. Yeah. But what strikes me about the Bauer quote here is if it's true, the um, the Odyssey has, quote, fewer overwhelming moments and a less demanding conception of human worth. Mm-hmm. Why is the Odyssey by far the more popular of the two epics? That's a really good question. because I think if, if you were to take a, a poll... Um, the Odyssey would by far come out on, on top. Hands down. Hands down. I don't know. Maybe it's the kind of the episodic nature of it, uh, the fantastical element, which is it's just attractive and alluring in its, in its own right. I mean, the Iliad is, is it's heavy. It's but heavy. the Iliad has some of those moments too, right? The horses uh, speak at one moment. You're right? talking about two lines, though. Uh, Fair. As opposed to like, you know, books A 9 through book. 12. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are those, the... the um, you know, the sneaking into the, the Trojan camp. Yeah, the raid. You've uh, got the great Diomedes and Glaucon exchange of armor. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some gripping episodes, but still, it's it's absolutely the case that most people know the Odyssey. They don't have any taste for the Iliad. Right. And maybe that's also simply because that um, it's still taught in high schools, right? Uh, I think it's the rare high school lit, like lit survey yes. that still does the Iliad. But that begs right? the question in mm-hmm. the sense that, well, then why? Right. I think it comes down to re- relatability. I think you know, as like, younger readers would see on the pages of the Odyssey, uh, much more in common, I think, than maybe the the fiction that they're reading mm-hmm. or the movies that they're seeing. Um, the Iliad is more like opera. The Iliad is kind of hardcore tragedy, mm-hmm. and that's demanding of the demanding viewer. of the yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair to say. Mm-hmm. So what are we going to give our listeners today, Jeff? Well, this is, we're wrapping it up. The Odyssey, I think this is uh, our 11th wow. and final episode wow. on the Odyssey. So, do, you, do you think we'll ever come back to elements of the Odyssey at some oh, point? De- I think we definitely will, right. Um, but it's a, it's been a long journey. It has. Um, but it's been really, really interesting to go through this in such detail. And you know, I'm realizing, you know, as you know, someone, at, probably you too, you know, who's taught this several times, um, I've been amazed by the the number of things that... I really haven't noticed before. Right. And uh, um, so it's been a lot of fun, but um, I'm also eager to to move on to new topics as well. Yes. So, yeah, we're going to try to wrap it up today. And we're going we're gonna to try to see, does Homer, how does Homer wrap it up? Okay. Um, and does he even wrap it up? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what kind of note does this, this epic end on? So, like, last week, we had the, arguably, the action climax. The suitors are... Book are, 22. Are, ...are dead. Uh, the threat from the house has been eliminated. Penelope and, and Odysseus are reunited, but it's not over yet. Mm-hmm. Well, they're they're reunited. They haven't kind of recognized they haven't had the recognition each other. scene, right? Okay, so that's yet to come. The right. suitors have been cleared away with the bulldozer of Odysseus's cold revenge. Yes, and now there's nothing between him and his wife. Right. Uh, but so why doesn't Homer simply end the tale uh, with reunion and recognition, which is coming in Book Twenty Three? Right. Um, that's a, it's an excellent question because if you look at if you looked at condensed versions of it or children's versions of the Odyssey or filmed versions, they almost always end with Penelope and Odysseus um, acknowledging each other and um, falling into each other's arms. Roll mm-hmm. the credits. Right. But Homer does not end it there. Hmm. And I think that's fascinating to kind of to, to, to debate about why and what he's up to. Well, let's do that. Let's do it. All right. So we're going to get into book 23 now. And Dave, I believe you're going to start us off with reading some Greek from yes. the beginning of that book. That's correct. The first four lines here of book 23. Greus de superro ana base ta kankala osa despoi ne era usa filan pos in end on e onta guna ta der rosan ta pades de huper ik tainanta ste der huper kefales kaimen pros muthan e e pen very nice it's very beautiful nice. language isn't it it is i love it so musical yeah it is and can you read for us uh, lombardo's translation sure so lombardo translates thusly uh, the old woman refers to euryclea 
The old woman laughed as she went upstairs to tell her mistress that her husband was home. She ran up the steps, lifting her knees high and bending over Penelope. She speaks. Yeah. Yes. So this detail here, lifting her knees high. She's high stepping. Yeah, but she's old, right? Right. She's been shambling around this palace for years, waiting for him to come back. Mm -hmm. And such insight uh, Homer has into the human condition and, and presented with such simple beauty. How is she going to behave now? Well, instead of telling us that uh, her youth has been revived by this good news, he just tells us that she's running up the steps and lifting her knees high. He's yeah. leaving it to us to draw out the significance yeah. of that yeah. detail. Yeah, isn't that brilliant? It is brilliant. Yeah. It's it's incredible. Yeah. Um, he's, he follows kind of the classic uh, kind of writer's rule, show, don't tell. Correct. Right? And that's incredible. Uh, but he's the first person to do it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Right. That's the more amazing thing. That's right. He's not following anybody's rule. No, that's, <laughs> that's it. The very first author in Western lit, the uh, every other people have made this point. Barry Powell, for example, mm-hmm. has made this point many times. The um, the first product is finished to a high degree, and that's that's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're yeah. gonna get some misdirection here, right? She's going upstairs, like you quoted f- for us from Lombardo, to tell her mistress that her husband was home. Yes. But what's gonna happen next? It's not gonna play out like that. In terms of like how Penelope- The reacts. reception. Reception, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanna add one more thing before we get, get to that. I think it's, uh, so you're clear like in, in her, lifting her knees, she's thrilled, of course, that her that Odysseus is back, right? But she's also thrilled that the suitors are dead, mm. right? She kind of she glories in the slaughter. You know, I know that last week I was doing some hand wringing about the suitors a little bit. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah, were, you were yeah. complexifying. Yeah, there's more, there's more hand wringing on the way. Okay, but I just think, I find this fascinating that Eurycleia is not troubled by the slaughter at all. Mm-hmm. It's part of the reason her knees are so high. Mm. So um, mm. that's a good contrast. Yeah. As I was uh, reading through Baura for this week's quote, yeah. I found that several of the points you made last week. Yeah. Uh, were reflected by Bauer. Oh, Bauer? Uh, really? For example, yeah. the Amphinimus. Oh, yeah. Not such a bad guy, Amphinimus. Did Bauer, did, did, he, did he show some kind of regret about the I death don't want to give you too much credit. Oh, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bauer was on your side. All right, cool. Cool, so that's it's, great. Uh, it's, a, it's a good reading of the Odyssey, I would say. Good, good. Uh, but back to Penelope. Yes, how does she receive the news? She, she doesn't buy it. She's skeptical. I, I find, again, the character of Penelope so fascinating throughout this but she does not react in the uh, kind of the stereotypical hallmark movie kind of way she doesn't r- jump out of bed and run downstairs right she, she doesn't believe it no she wants she needs proof interesting that you mentioned the hallmark movie yes because hallmark did make a movie about the odyssey no they didn't yes, they, they really? did armand asante that was by hallmark I think so. <laughs> was <it really>? Hallmark <laughs> and NBC. Okay, that that, that uh, multi-part yes. series. Yes, Armando Santi was Odysseus. We talked about this, I think, briefly. Isabella yeah. Rossellini, the lovely Italian actress, was a gray-eyed Athena. That's right. And do you do you remember when we were in Greece that there was still some peak there from the Greeks that you had these two Italians oh, I playing don't Athena that. and Odysseus? <laughs> I don't remember that, but that's, that's uh, yeah, it's not going to get an opa, is No, it? it is not going to get an opa, but no. there was some, it was, I mean, I think if I were to look back on it uh, now, what, 20 plus years on. 96, 97. Is that when it came mm-hmm. up? Yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of cheese ball elements. In oh, there. sure. But there were some really, I thought, quite effective. Definitely. Um, kind of uses of Homer. An and, excellent representation. I think it's the best representation on the screen of the Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Even despite its limitations. Yes. But even that one basically ends with right. husband and wife uh, back together again, and that's Correct. it, right? Ignores book 24. Yes, it puts some, uh, what, some petroleum jelly on the lens and, you know, <laughs> fades off into just a nice... Exactly. Very gauzy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's not how Homer's going no. to end this. No, 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 at all, right. So Penelope says what, basically, when the news is announced to her by Eurycleia? We get, again, we get a little rare inner dialogue. She, do, she doesn't know how she should approach this, right? She doesn't, should I run up and hug him? Should I kiss him? Should I just play it coy and cool and kind of uh, kind of read the, read the room? And she chooses choice C there. She's mm-hmm. not going to just kind of give into this, mm. right? And I think it's, it's uh, not exactly clear why. Mm-hmm. So, I, mean, how do you, I mean, how do you kind of read Penelope at that moment? Is she stubborn? Is she just, she's just like her husband? No, I, I think it's two part. 
it, part it is is that she is just like her husband. Mm-hmm. She has the same strength of character and wit. I think the other part of it is having been separated for so long, 17, 18, 19 years, the heart is slow to trust good news after mm. year after year of sorrow and sadness. That's a really good point. Yeah. I don't know if you would, I don't know if likening it to the concept of Stockholm syndrome, right? But if you have been trapped in some really miserable situation, physical or emotional, when your rescuer arrives, you don't want to believe it yeah. because the cost is so high. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I, I, I just can't afford to be, um, I can't afford to be disappointed again. Yeah. And we know that she's, she's you know, she's interviewed people who stopped at the island, right? And she's heard all kinds of different rumors about, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I heard about this and he's over here. And she can be forgiven for yeah. not believing just yet another one. Right. And to trivialize my previous comment, you know, which had, I think, some feeling and real pathos in it. Remember last week when we were a day late on releasing our episode? Yes. And for a whole day, no one could download Ad Nauseum. Yes. And then when it was released on Wednesday, a day later than our usual practice, people had a little bit of this, I can't believe it. You right. Know, this news is too good to be true. <laughs> yes, yeah. A kind of Penelope reaction. Yes, yes, I felt it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's an effective trivializing, isn't it? It is. I like that a lot. Okay. Yep. Yep. So where do we go next? Well, um, I think uh, Telemachus's response to his mother is, is really interesting. So Penelope comes downstairs and she's regarding the uh, the beggar, and now I mean I would and I would still argue that at some level Penelope knows that this is Odysseus, right? She wouldn't have announced the contest of the bow when she announced it if she hadn't really known how that was all going to play out. But yet she's something has hold her back, and Telemachus can't believe it at this point either. And so let me read from from Lombardo's translation here. This is in the in the words of Telemachus. In Telemachus, yes, right. exactly. He says, "Mother, how can you be so hard?" Holding back like that, why don't you sit next to father and talk to him? Ask him things. No other woman would have had would have the heart to stand out from her husband who's come back for 20 hard years to his country and home. But your heart is always colder than stone. And then Penelope, cautious as ever. My child, I am lost in wonder and unable to speak or ask a question or look him in the eyes. Hold on a moment. Yes. Is your Telemachus voice and your... Penelope voice the same? Was I supposed to be, what am I supposed to be higher pitched here? Well, something. <laughs> this is the first time you're calling me out on this? How yeah. many characters have I, have, I, have I read and you read and now I'm supposed to be Mel Blanc here? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reference. <laughs> well, if, I'm a, I'm if gonna, the listener doesn't know who Mel Blanc is. He, um, yeah, play tell us. Well, he was the voice of the Looney Tunes character. Yeah, so many of them. Yep. Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig. You know, all of them. All those Elmer Fudd. Yep. I'm gonna, anyway, if, let me... At the risk of offending you, I'm just going to keep my voice okay. as is, right? So she says, My child, I am lost in wonder and unable to speak or ask a question or look him in the eyes. If he really is Odysseus come home, the two of us will be sure of each other. Very sure. There are secrets between us no one else knows. Ah. Again, she's kind of she's like laying down a, a, a challenge there. That's a nice tease, isn't it? Very. Homer has piqued our curiosity. Right. And this is not... this Again, it's so... Un Hollywood, mm-hmm. right? It's still a contest between them, mm-hmm. and I think that's part of that. Uh, that I think Penelope goes down on to say that she wanted to be absolutely sure, mm-hmm. right? She may have been rolling the dice a little bit when she said she, when she announced the contest, but she w- wanted to take no chance that she would be unfaithful to Odysseus. Mm-hmm. So she had to be. She had to cross every T, dot every I, meaning except someone other than the real McCoy. Exactly right. Right. So, and and I buy that, but I think there's also this idea that she kind of wants to win. She wants to get her husband to kind of drop the win what? What do you mean? This game. Acknowledge who's the who's going to be the one to kind of fall into the other one's arms. Hmm. Who's going to it's so there's kind of this polutropos one-upmanship going on here. And so hmm. here she says, well, if he is Odysseus, Let's see how much he knows. Well, I really like uh, Odysseus's response to that part you just quoted. Mm-hmm. Odysseus, quoting Lombardo, Odysseus, who had borne much, smiled, and his words flew to his son on wings. He had endured much, but his response to Penelope's desire to continue the test is to smile. Yes. Right? It pleases him. It does. So let's not discount that as one of Penelope's motives also. to Because she, she knows he'll like this. Correct. Yes. She knows after all he's been through, all the tests he has passed, the monsters he has faced, he really wants this 
to be the challenging climax of the story, mm -hmm. meaning he's got to win me back too. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not going to make it easy. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Right. So tell uh, course, Telemachus, this guy who's just shown up, Yes, I mean, it's his father, but he doesn't know this guy, mm -hmm. right? And Penelope and it is have this long history. And I love that there's so much more behind their relationship than Telemachus could ever fathom. Right. Right. And so. It, she, well, that's common, right? A husband and a wife, a father and a mother. Children, uh, I'm kind of experiencing this now because I have kids who are a little bit older than yours. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're moving into adulthood and uh, they're sometimes mystified by the. You know the the mother father husband wife um, dynamic. Yeah, yeah. And yeah they yeah. kind of think they have part of it figured out or glimpsed, and then something surprising comes up, and they say, "What? I had no idea that you know, this were or that was the case." Right. I'm not using any actual details you yes. notice here, uh, but that's part of it, right? Of Telemachus course. is looking in wonder at uh, Odysseus and Penelope thinking, well, what secrets could they have? Yeah, exactly. What, what I've been I, in this house for 20 years. Right. What don't I know? But that, I mean, thus is the kind of the depth of their, of their relationship. So yeah, there's, there's, there's nobody that Odysseus responds to in this whole epic like he responds to Penelope. Mm -hmm. And she, she has, uh, the effect that she has on him, the kind of the level of equality that she has with him is, is, uh, is profound. Yeah. And in addition, the reveal is not going to be the scar, right? No. It's something far more profound and interesting. Yes, exactly right. But next, Jeff, Odysseus says something that's really kind of surprising. It is, right? So he's, he's reacting to kind of what has just happened in, in the hall. And again, Lombardo translates, and he's speaking to the group. He says, well, we have killed a city of young men, the flower of Ithaca. Think about that. Hmm. I mean, is he just kind of realizing now some of, of the larger implications of, of what's happened? Hmm. I mean, this is another one of those things, again, I'm not trying to needlessly complicate this story. <laughs> but I think this is often missed in kind of traditional understandings of this tale. Fair. Right? So the, usually it's, he killed the suitors, they're the bad guys, hero wins, it's parade time. Mm -hmm. Right? But now Odysseus realizes, I just killed a good portion of the nobles of my own kingdom. Right. Right? How's that going to play? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't play very well. Well, I think, I think he has thought it through to some extent. I, I don't know. It's hard to tell. I, I think it's fair to say there's nothing in the text which indicates he has thought through the repercussions of this, yes. of this vengeance. Yeah. There's nothing in the text. So the principle that I've cited in other episodes, I think I'm relying here upon Dodds, right? Mm -hmm. If it's not in the text, if the poet doesn't say it, you're not um, allowed to conclude it, right? Right. On the other hand... Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, it seems odd that a person of such tremendous prescience as Odysseus, where he doesn't just drive the sword into the Cyclops' side when he has the opportunity mm -hmm. in the cave in Book 9, yes. because he realizes, if I do that, I can't get out, a person of that much prescience is not going to realize that killing off all the suitors isn't going to make life extraordinarily difficult for himself and his family. Yes, it is really strange. It's really strange. I mean, one of the ways I've, re I've read this is that I get, we, the Odysseus we see in the hall is in the grips of a kind of Achilles-like rage and that he's blind to everything and that just the retributive justice in that moment is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. And now he's kind of having a, a, an Ajax-like moment where now the cloud is lifted and yes, Athena got what she wanted. Destiny got what it wanted. But now he's kind of left holding this bag. Hmm. He's, I'm still king over hmm. these people. And I think Homer, to his credit, he lets that run. And thus we get book 24, where the families of these guys yeah. say, what happened? The blood feud. And they're ready to take up arms again. Right. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to be said for that. Mm -hmm. I think Homer is maybe teaching the lesson that uh, certainly I, I'm on good grounds with this interpretation because the ancients believed that Homer was always teaching a lesson. Yeah. They saw him not just as an entertainer, but as the moral guide for exactly for much of life until, uh -huh. until Plato. But in any event, Homer's teaching the lesson that you can have your Achillean rage and satisfy your bloodlust, but it doesn't end there. Yeah. You're going to have to deal with the consequences. The consequences, yeah. And I think that, that maps perfectly on, mm -hmm. on what's happening here. So then there's a ruse that's put in place. Yeah. So um, Odysseus realizes, okay, word's going to get out. Um, there's going to be more challenges ahead. And so he says, we've got, to, we've got to cover our tracks. So he says, let's get some musicians in here. 
Let's start singing some songs. Let's make it sound like there's a, a party, like there's a wedding going a on. Stage here. a wedding. Stage a wedding. Right. And so people coming by won't be suspicious. I guess people walking by the house in the previous years would be used to hearing carousing going oh, on. Oh, right. And now it's literally dead quiet, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, ching. Yeah. You got 118 suitors, right, who yep. were coming in and out, mm-hmm. and there were uh, so many goats from Melanthius. There were hogs coming down from Eumaeus and yeah. rivers of wine flowing. And now nothing. It's dead silence. <laughs> dead silence, right. So, and then also, you, you provoked me into that. I know I did. Oh. But then the wedding, too, right, the musing about, well, maybe a passerby will think, oh, I recognize those songs. That's a... Uh, you know, they represent that, that, that Bee Gees hit. Um, that's a, what's a classic wedding song, right? I don't uh, think so. No? What is the classic Bach piece that's played at all weddings? Like like the wedding march? Yeah, is that what it is? Da, 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 well, that's, that's graduation. Da. Is that pomp and circumstance? Yes, I guess so. <laughs> I can't think of the... I know what you're thinking, right? right? Isn't a wedding a kind of graduation? I... <laughs> I was thinking more, this is the reception, you're, you know, they're playing Cool in the Gang, Celebration, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking of Taco Bell's Cannon. <laughs> I think that's what it must be. Yeah, Taco right. Bell's Cannon, that's the one that's usually played at weddings. Right. So they got Taco Bell's Cannon. And so people walking around think, from the speakers. Exactly, and the people are thinking, finally, Penelope married one of these guys. Yes. Right. So it's all part of kind of this, this that's a fairly well thought out ruse, it I is. suppose. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, he's trying to cover his tracks in the in the moment mm. well we'll hang on to that i'm gonna use a phrase that hang on to what th- well, this kind of this uh you know the consequences the coming okay. consequences, all right. right and i'm gonna use a phrase that i that i hate but i'm gonna use it anyway we're gonna put a pin in that <laughs> right and we'll come back to it because we got to get husband and wife back together how does this play out well someday we need to do an episode on phrases we hate Ooh, that'd be good look top, our top nine another oh, top nine I, I have a lot of phrases <laughs> i hate it'd be hard to winnow, winnow them down yes right? i'll just give a little uh teaser here oh, yeah, I, yeah. I hate the phrase going forward oh yeah we, we were talking about this, we were right, right. Yeah. what is the opposite of going forward <laughs> shambling backward <laughs> shambling backward yes so i'd like, I'd like to hear a, a, a talk that. beginning with that um uh, well shambling backward <laughs> right uh, we're gonna do this yeah so right. Athena then makes Odysseus look extra studly. Extra studly. Yeah. Right? Another one. You know, she made him look extra stanky. Right. Right. And now. Senescent. Now she pours the the glory of youth all over him. Ambrosial locks. Right. Right. Exactly. Takes the age off of him yeah. and uh, does some exfoliation and so forth. Maybe some oat milk shampoo was Cucumbers used. on the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he, gets a, he gets a spa day in an instant. <laughs> And then what? And then, um, I'm sorry, I'm still thinking about the cucumbers, <laughs> right? Uh, and so now uh, Odysseus plays her her last trick. And this is where I think... Did it, you say Odysseus plays uh, her Penelope, last Penelope. trick? You, you, you threw me with that, I'm sorry. that image. Penelope plays her last trick. Okay. And if you think of this as kind of a uh, battle of wits, then I think you could say Penelope wins this one. Okay, so let me read that quote. Please. In my Penelope voice. Oh, no, no. <laughs> You're a mysterious man. Please, please go on. (laughs) Sorry. I am not being proud or scornful, nor am I bewildered, not at all. I know very well what you looked like when you left Ithaca on your long-oared ship. Nurse, bring the bed out from the master bedroom. The bedstead he made himself and spread it for him with fleeces and blankets and silky coverlets. She was testing her husband. Odysseus could bear no more, and he cried out to his wife, By God, woman, now you've cut deep. Who moved my bed? It would be hard for anyone, no matter how skilled, to move it. A god could come down and move it easily, but not a man alive, however young and strong, could ever pry it up. There's something telling him about how that bed's built, and no one else built it but me. So he gives the whole game away in that moment, right? So uh, as, as I understand it, or as I, I picture, he actually built this bed out of a tree, right, that grows up in the middle of the... The well, house or the, the bedroom's built around the tree. That's right. Yeah. So this is an olive, one of these thousand-year-old olives. Olive trees can live uh, to a very great age. In fact, some of them are almost impossible to kill. You cut them down, they sprout right back up, I understand. Yeah. So this was a massive old olive tree. He built the house around it, and the bedroom, their bedroom, has as its center this massive olive stump into which he built the the head of the bed. Right, right. Brilliant. Brilliant, yes. But for and, but for Penelope here to suggest that it's some kind of futon mm-hmm. that she can roll out the room. Right. It's it's the last straw for him. Well, right. and it's a it's an excellent test on her part. Yeah. Because once again she doesn't say, uh, so what kind of a bed do we have, stranger? She doesn't <laughs> give him the opportunity to guess. 
she assumes by her own deceit and misdirection, she assumes that he doesn't know. Yeah. And that's what really drives him nuts. Yeah, exactly. It kind of reminds me of the end of the Cyclops episode too, where again, he can't stand not telling the Cyclops, you know, who has fooled him. And so again, Penelope knows her husband very well. She knows that this bed is a huge point of pride for him. And so she needles him with that. And uh, that little bit of hubristic part of him has got to spill the beans about how awesome this bed is and, and the craftsmanship he put into it. Yeah, you're mixing some metaphors here with the needling and the spilled beans. It would have to be a pine tree, right, rather than an olive if there was going to be any needling. Oh, I see. You're going to get that specific with, yes, the, I am. with the botany here. Th- that's my pitch. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So no pi- it's not a pine? No. Nope. Okay. So no needling. All right. So uh, to close out the book, um, we get kind of a recap of the of the whole story. Uh, so Odysseus yes. kind of breaks down all the wanderings. He basically gives um, Penelope a version of books 9 through 12. Right. right? He does, and he doesn't leave out the Calypso and Circe part either. No, yeah. no. And the listener is thinking, why couldn't we just skip to this part of book 23? <laughs> right, right. This is, the, this is the, the cliff notes. The Reader's Digest version. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We hear about, we get, we get another reminder of that Odysseus knows that his wanderings still aren't over. We, we recall Tiresias is saying, listen, when you get home. The prophecy. The prophecy, you've got to go out with this winnowing fan on mm-hmm. your shoulder. And this is where most Hollywood versions of the, uh, of the epic would end. A husband and wife are back together. But we've got a full book to go and lots more interesting things to come. But we've got to pause for our break. <music> Listeners, this week's episode is brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, listen closely, please. Mark Helwig and his team in Portland, Oregon have solved your aesthetic and brew-based problems. Why spend 4 to $6 on coffee purchase in some drive through when you can brew, get this, better coffee at home? The Ratio 6 and its big brother, the 8, beautiful automatic pour-over machines that consistently brew the finest java. You want to check this out. Absolutely. The Ratio 6 comes in three different gorgeous colors. They're stainless steel, right, in matte and white. These things are made out of the highest quality. And what color is your 8? Well, my aid is um, is an oyster color. Oyster. I, I chose it to match. It's kind of an off grayish. Yeah. I think probably the best description is oyster. <laughs> <laughs> I chose it to match our cabinets and so forth. And it's got walnut accents. It's a thing of beauty. Nice. It's yes. really nice. And your uh, six, my the six one... is, is, a, is a stainless steel. It, it's, a, it's a work of art. It puts the rest of my kitchen to shame. Really? It does. <laughs> your other appliances just kind of skulk around in humiliation. They do. They shrug their shoulders. And right. it's, it's kind of pathetic. Yeah. Mm. Good stuff. So we're brewing up delicious coffee, each of us, mm-hmm. each day, yeah. right? And uh, how does the process work? Is this a drip? No, this is a, is a pour over pour machine. Pour over. Yes. But do you have to stand there and do the pouring yourself? You don't, but you want to stand there and watch it. Yeah. So the machine does all the work. It sends the water soaring through its metallic veins. and um, You push a button, right? Push a button, yep. A little LED light comes on. Yep. And then it goes through what's called the bloom stage. Bloom. Gets rid of all this nasty CO2. Off gases. Uh, off gases it. And uh, then the machine pours the water right through the grounds. And the coffee is just perfect. You go to the brew stage, and then it's ready, and then it's uh, it's lyrical. It is lyrical. Yeah, it's right. really, really nice. So yeah. this audience, though, this is an amazing audience we have it listening. It is, yes. Uh, Mark tells me that they have sold uh, a, quite a number of uh, Ratio 6 machines using our coupon. So it's... <laughs> It's incredible. We're so grateful to you, you loyal listeners who yeah. are supporting our sponsors like this. It's amazing. And yeah. I mean, you're also getting a great deal because this machine is not going to wear out in a couple of years like one of the plastic ones that's made in some mold. No, this is an heirloom. So Jeff, why don't you tell our listeners how to score one for themselves? Yes. So listeners, go to RatioCoffee.com right now, Ratio, R-A-T-I-O, and you can get a 15% exclusive discount on the Ratio 6. Just enter the special code ANCO for 15% off the Ratio 6. ANCO, RatioCoffee.com. Check it out. Now, Jeff, we have another fabulous sponsor, don't we? We do? Yeah, that would be Hackett Publishing. Mm -hmm. Since 1972, Hackett has been setting the standard for affordable, high-quality translations in classics and many other areas of the humanities. Jeff, what do you like about the Hackett editions? I like it. They're the rare publisher where I have ordered text for my classes because they, they give great translations of, of ancient Greek and Roman works. They're accurate, but also really accessible. And they're also books that I'd like to order for myself. Right. Yeah. So when, I, you know, when I'm working on a translation project or uh, designing a new class, Hackett is, all, is very often where I go to first. It's your go-to. It is. 
And I love their Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, the Hans Orberg series of Latin books. The absolute best, I would say. You would recommend this to any Latin teacher or French year student, yes. Definitely. Mm-hmm. The hardcover, glossy color pages, excellent. So, Jeff, can you, uh, can you tell our listeners how they can get a really nice discount at Hackett? I can. So, listeners, right now you can save 20% on any order, anything you want from Hackett Publishing, and receive free shipping. All free you have, shipping? It is. It's a great deal. That's incredible. Yeah. So, go check out their huge selection at HackettPublishing.com, Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, Publishing.com. Find the text you want, enter AN2021 in the box, which asks for the coupon code, and do not hesitate, do it today. Check it out. This week's episode is also brought to you by Odd Ostra Coffee, the coffee that takes you to the stars, but without all that nasty pear aspera stuff. Right, the hard stuff. Yeah. So this is a company located down in Hillsdale, Michigan, mm-hmm. just a short walk from the Vomitorium. Not yeah. Uh, Patrick Whalen and his crew, they're roasting some delicious beans down there. I was checking out their social media this week, and they uh, they have a name for their roaster. They do? Yeah, it's called Big Red. Big Red. Yeah, like the gum from the 70s. Oh, yeah, that, that, that cinnamon-flavored gum. That's right. right. So Big Red, the Big Red Roaster. That's right. Yeah. Each bag, they say, of our specialty coffee begins on this 800-pound roaster from Mill City Roasters in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And at Astra, they hand-roast each batch of coffee so that you can taste the extraordinary flavor in every cup. Yes, as Patrick also has um, put up on their website, he writes, our goal is to create extraordinary quality in the cup, value for our producers and customers, and strong local communities. Yes. Yes. So you like the Tenebris, right? The Tenebris is, is probably my favorite. Definitely. Yep. But there's also Huehuetenango. You always, <laughs> I like you always get that. to say that. There's yes. the Las Lajas <laughs> Microlot, the Femenino from Guatemala. Yes. A whole range of really delicious flavors and the poetry series. It's, yes. Well, the, the poetry uh, from various uh, noted poets is right there on the bag for you to enjoy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, whatever your taste in, in Java, um, you're going to find it here. And they're going to put that Winkle Haiku on the poetry label we're, at some point? It's, it's, still, uh, in it's, ne- it's still in committee. In negotiation. In negotiation, right. All right. So Dave, what can our listeners get out of all of this? Well, they can go to Odd Astra Roasters, A-D-A-S-T-R-A, oddastraroasters.com. They need to enter the coupon code, which is A-N-A-A. That's A-N-A-A, and they'll get 10% off any order. It's worth it. Check it out. So, Jeff, as we get back into it now, we are in the home stretch, the downward slope. This is it. This is the end. This is book 24. The Iliad, as the listener knows, all the books are entitled after the uppercase, the majuscule letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, and so forth. The Odyssey, the lowercase. Yes. So this would be what? Little... Omega. Little Omega. Right, we're at the end. All right. Yeah. And as the book opens, we have an appearance of Hermes. Hermes. The Sucopomp. Yes, the Sukopump, the, yeah. the, the guide of souls. Correct. That's why he has his fancy hat. He's got his fancy sandals with the wings on them. And he has this caduceus or caducus, mm-hmm. which is the wand, which has snakes twined around it. Yep, sometimes wings on it too. Right. Yep. And uh, this is the, the tool he uses to guide souls down into the underworld. I mean, lots of casual fans of Greek mythology will know... Um, Hermes as the messenger god, Mm -hmm. but this is also uh, a very important role that he plays. Um, His second shift work. Second shift work, exactly. Right. So he, as a messenger, he can cross planes of existence. And so he's, he can take people from the land of the living down to the dead. And back again occasionally. Yeah. It's an extension of his messenger role. Mm -hmm. So he's a liminal figure. (laughs) So as the book opens, we have this from Lombardo. Hermes, meanwhile, was calling forth the ghosts of the suitors. He held the wand he uses to charm mortal eyes to sleep and make sleepers awake. And with this beautiful golden wand, he marshaled the ghosts who followed along, squeaking and gibbering. Squeaking and gibbering. Isn't that great? That's great. <laughs> Not only a good translation, but of course what lies behind it is brilliant Greek. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I love this scene is where um, Agamemnon, of course, who we've already met, hanging down there in the underworld. He has this kind of nice long exchange. He and Achilles are hanging out down there, hmm. talking together, and they see the suitors come. Yeah. And then Agamemnon recognizes one of them and says, hey, you know, you hosted me once uh, on Ithaca. What's going on? Right. Why are you, all you guys showing up at once? Aren't you a little early? <laughs> right, right, right. So, and this is, this is great. Um, and I don't know if this is unintended comedy, but this strikes me as funny. As the, so the suitor, he gives, he tells, again, it's kind of a recap of what happened in the hall, but from the suitor's point of view. And it's this long sob story. You know, he tricked us. He, you know, look what this guy did to us. Now we're all dead down here. <laughs> And the way Agamemnon re- responds, you know, he's, this guy's clearly trolling for pity. And Agamemnon responds with, well done, Odysseus, Laertes' wily son. 
He's like, yes, he right. did it. Right. It's no pity at all for these guys. No. Yep, yep. So, are you going to go on with that? Because oh, there's some great stuff there. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so Agamemnon goes out and he goes, you want a wife of great character and Icarus' daughter. It's as if he's speaking to Odysseus, right? What a mind she has, a woman beyond reproach. How well Penelope kept in her heart her husband, Odysseus. And so her virtue's fame will never perish. And the gods will make among men on earth a song of praise for steadfast Penelope. But Tyndareus' daughter was evil to the core, killing her own husband. And her song will be a song of scorn, bringing ill repute to all women, even the virtuous. Yeah, so here, Agamemnon, he starts out well, but the speech quickly descends into self pity It does, right. Because Tyndareus' daughter is Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra, right. So Clytemnestra and Helen, half-siblings, Castor and Pollux. And of course, the listener knows, and the, the reader of the poem, right, receives its performance, knows He's complaining about how Clytemnestra offed him. Yes, exactly right. When he got back to Mycenae with Cassandra, Clytemnestra killed him in the bathtub. Yep. So Agamemnon, but, yeah. But he, he does, his character softens a bit as a dead man. You know, when we saw him earlier in book 11, you know, he's trying to help Odysseus out, you know. You know says, no, this Beware is what, yeah, this is what happened to me. Back, exactly right. right. And so here he has all kinds of... Praise for Odysseus, but even more praise for Penelope. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Agamemnon in the Iliad, he's not a guy that's given props to anybody else. So you think this makes him more sympathetic? Um, in a way. I, I, just, I mean, I think he's used as kind of a comic foil here. Yes, but right. I, this speech leaves me a little bit cold, the way he starts out, right, praising Odysseus. But at the end, it's, it's all about him. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's, he's still Agamemnon to his core, but I think he does... He, he softens up as, a, as someone without huggable portions. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Yeah. But he's, he's also um, chauvinistic. Oh, yeah. Misogynistic. I know it's very easy to say that, you know, all the ancients were like that. I think that's a gross overgeneralization. Agreed. Agreed. Agamemnon certainly is. This, this final uh, quote here, a song of scorn bringing ill repute to all women, even the virtuous. <laughs> even the virtuous. Even if you're a virtuous woman, Agamemnon's going to hate you. He, right. <laughs> he, he can no longer distinguish yeah. between his Penelope's and his Clytemnestris. Is, is, is. That is a pretty dark turn at the yeah. end. Of the okay. All right. All right. All right. Fair enough. All right. Back to the upper world. Okay. All right. We've got one last reunion recognition scene to take place. And this too, I find weird and somewhat troubling. So the last person that Odysseus has to reunite with is his dad. Laertes. Right. Remember, remember, we met his, his the ghost of his mother. His mother mm-hmm. has passed away. Anticlea. She was in the underworld. Yeah. But his father, Laertes, is still at home. And like Penelope, he's been weeping and mourning all these years, um, hoping that his son will come back. And take care of him. Yeah. Provide for him in his old age. Right. Penelope has provided somewhat for her father-in-law, but she has provided a funeral shroud. Right. And there's no sense of honor or glory in that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, like Penelope, Laertes, uh, um, I don't think we call attention to it, but remember, Penelope slept through the whole slaughter. She missed it all. Um, and Laertes, likewise, has been out in the orchard. And so he has no idea what's just, what's just happened. And he, he sleeps out there kind of in a, in a um, shed where they keep the tools for dressing the vines and taking care of the vineyard. Yeah, he's he, kind of like the dog. He's he like ref- Yes, he sort of refuses to sleep in the house in the presence of the suitors. Mm-hmm. He prefers to be out there just like on a pile of uh, broken down old boards and so forth. Right. It's, he's utterly decrepit. Yep. So the thing that bothers me about this scene is that um, when Odysseus comes up to his father, and uh, you get the sense that his father asks the same question that he asks anybody, stranger, who shows up. And he says, basically, you know, what, what have you heard about my son? And Odysseus immediately launches into another one of his stories, right? <laughs> he fabricates a whopper. I'm so-and-so from this place, right? And he goes on and on and on and on. And it's at the end of his little tale that uh, Laertes crumples into grief. So, Dave, will you read a little bit of this for us? Yeah, this is in my Odysseus voice. I'll tell you everything point by point. I come from Alibus and have my home there. I'm the son of Aphaetus and Polypaemon's grandson. My name is Aperitus. Some storm spirit drove me off course from Sicily and, as luck had it, here. My ship stands off wild country far from the town. As for Odysseus, it's been five years now since he left my land, ill-fated maybe, but the birds were good when he sailed out on the right. Well, at least the birds were good. Yeah. <laughs> but again, <laughs> lies. Lies. So, and, and such complexity of lies. His name, his father's name, his grandfather's name, where he's from, and a little bit of contrived backstory about bumping into Odysseus. Right. And the, so the big question 
that I have and my students always have when they read this is, why? What's the point of this lie? You could justify a lie earlier where he's trying to get an advantage over an enemy or fool somebody, um, one of the suitors. But now everybody's, all the suitors are dead. What is the purpose of this lie? I think it's the same as the purpose of his lie to Penelope, testing fidelity. At this point, even his his ancient father, he's going to see, has this guy been on my side? Well, I think so. Really? Yes. Maybe it's implausible. I'm just going to run to this for a minute. Maybe it's implausible in terms of what effect Laertes' distrust or disloyalty would have on Odysseus. In other words, if Penelope has been disloyal to Odysseus, then Odysseus has a big problem, right? Mm-hmm. If Laertes has been disloyal, well, what's the what's the actual consequence? Mm. Maybe not so great. But the other part is the just the emotional aspect. Odysseus wants to know, you know, have have you really missed me? Hmm. Have you been loyal to me in your heart? And I, I think he just wants to find that out. And the only tool at his disposal is this deceit. Yeah. You're not persuaded. Well, no, I think... I, I really like that answer. I like the answer. I like how you kind of distinguished uh, the cost of, of loyalty. I hadn't really thought about it that way before. Let me just read a little bit more. Sure. Um, because when he finishes his little his little lie, um, we get uh, again this from Lombardo. He says, "A black mist of pain shrouded Laertes. He scooped up fistfuls of shimmering dust and groaned as he poured it upon his gray head. This wrung Odysseus's heart, and bitter longing stung his nostrils as he watched his father." And with a bound, he embraced him, kissed him, and said, I'm the one that you miss, Father, right here back in my homeland after 20 years. So Odysseus, it's, I, I've always read that as, why does Odysseus tell the lie? He can't help himself. Hmm. Again, his own identity, and if we bring this back to the Andra, the word that started this yep. poem, does Odysseus even know who he is anymore? Hmm. He's constantly changed his own identity. Athena has made him old. He's made him young. He doesn't even know what he looks like anymore. Would he recognize himself in, in a mirror or, an, or in a, you know, the, the sheen of water? And so can he even help himself? And it's, it's that seeing his father kind of just collapse. Under the weight of the, the lie. He doesn't bother with it. He says, it's me. It's me. Yeah. Yeah. That's persuasive. Let, let the listener note, you know, I'm sure they listen with pencil and paper. I completely concede to the superiority of Winkle's interpretation oh, wow, here. Thank you. Right. That, that's much better. I should write this down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to recap, Odysseus tells this lie because he can't control himself. And when he sees the effect it has on his own father, mm-hmm. someone that must be sympathetic to him, he kind of repents. Yes. He changes his mind in a flash mm-hmm. and he leaps across, grabs his father and kisses him and says, I'm back. It's I'm me. Back. I've yeah. killed the suitors in our house and avenged all of the wrongs that have grieved your heart. Right. But then he also goes on to say, but there's no time for this right now because right. there's a lot of angry people. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to the fake wedding. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, the official reunion has taken place. Recognition takes place. This um, is the last one, isn't it? This is the last one, but the story still isn't over, Right. And um, I don't know, I think I've found that in, in teaching this, a lot of students are exhausted by this. They kind of want the Hollywood ending. You're so, talking about students or listeners to this podcast? Well, I don't know about the listeners, how they okay. feel about it. They can write, they would, I would love if they wrote in. Yeah, well, us. they can pause and get a cup of coffee from their ratio eight and come back refreshed. There you go, nicely done. Thank you. Um, but uh, again, students say, well, okay, why can't we end it here now? But no, it goes on. Yeah. It goes on. He says, Dad, we've got we've to gotta strap on the armor. Because there's, there's more war to come. Right, exactly. So there was the recognition. So there was mm-hmm. the scar. He used the scar with his dad, like he used it elsewhere, yep. uh, to show that he really is who he claims. But now the relatives of the suitors are coming. They need to have their revenge for the yes. death of all these suitors. Yep, torches and pitchforks. Yes. Was all of this uh, you know, angry mob to see you? Do you have an appointment? <laughs> yeah, we actually called ahead. Was, was this all such a bright idea? Is the retributive justice in the hall worth what's going to be a kind of civil war? Right. Again, what's the... Did Odysseus 
not think about the fallout from this? Is he, is he so in Iliad mode that he's forgotten what it's like to be a king? And you're going to discount absolutely the fact that Homer's just telling what happened. What, that, what did I miss? I'm sorry? You're going to discount the idea that Homer is just telling us what happened like a history. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, no, I'm not discounting that. I well, mean, you I, discounted it in a previous episode. Did I? Yes, with with prejudice. <laughs> it was prejudicial discounting. You asked me, why does this happen? And I said, oh. well, maybe it happens in the Odyssey because it's like history. So even if it doesn't fit Hollywood, you know, he's bound to describe the aftermath. Okay, I think you're confused. I think you're thinking that I'm complaining about this. I actually like kind of the realism here. Oh, you do like I the do realism. Like realism. I think what I'm what I'm pushing back against is this kind of this notion of Odysseus as kind of a squeaky clean, uh, you know, crafty hero, and we celebrate him in everything that he does. No, I like kind of this grittiness. He's that, more like a mafioso. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. I, I like that. I like that a lot. So again, he's saying, "Oh, okay. Well, if this is what's the the, the consequences." Let's take up the spear and shield and yep. lace deal up your with boots. Yep. Let's see what happens. And at this point, Athena steps in. Right, and it's uh, it's almost as if Athena didn't really see this coming. That's not possible. Well, I mean, Athena doesn't have kind of a window into into fate. Yeah, she has. I think she has uh, Zeus on speed dial, though, right? That that helps, right? But there's kind of a sense that okay, she's she's also kind of scrambling because she wanted the story to end in book twenty two mm-hmm. as, as well. And so she kind of she comes down, and before the island can erupt into another round of bloodshed, she comes down and says, "Ithacans, lay down your arms." And basically, this story is done. Right. She's the the Dea ex machina. Yeah. The goddess from the machine. Right. Do you do you find that kind of a lazy ending? As no. that's often taken to be. No, it's not a lazy it's, ending. It's, a, it's a kind of a, a. How can you fault a man after writing twenty four <laughs> books with you know several dozen? Carefully intricated, uh, intricated, carefully, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> carefully constructed. There you go. Complex. Carefully constructed and intricate plot lines. Yes. Hundreds of characters. How can you then fault him because the goddess steps in at the last moment as a lazy ending? Well, I, I, in some ways, I think it's at odds with a lot of the themes of the book of this kind of recession of the gods. I mean, so much has been put on the shoulders of Odysseus as a man, as an Andra. So to end it not with an Andra, but with a Thea, it's a it's a bit of a jolt. Okay, here's the point then. Yeah. Let's let's try this one out. It may appear throughout the course of the Odyssey that unlike in the Iliad, it's human will that drives the action. Yes. But by placing Athena at the end, Homer uh, reinforces the point that it is the gods that are driving all this. So it's a kind of surprise ending. In a way, or it... Uh, yeah, a kind of a ha-ha. Uh, <laughs> you, you all thought that this was Odysseus, but no, it's Athena behind everything. All right, I'll take that. You'll take that? I like a good ha-ha ending. Okay. Yeah. So again, uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining uh, about it. Never stopped you before. <laughs> but I, I just thought it, it is a... It's it's a little jarring. All I right. Think, right. But I'll take jarring. I okay. trust Homer. All um, right. So yeah. how about I read the last three lines of the epic... In Greek. Yes, please do. And then you give us the last few lines from Lombardo and Will. Uh, we'll take this to its conclusion. Yes. All right, so this is book 24, lines 546 through 548. Horkia dao, katopiste metam fatoroisin sin atheken, pala sathe nai e kure dias ai giochoya, mentori e domene e mendemas e dekai audain. And that's the last ringing note of the lyre. Yeah, yeah. it is. That's and you've got great. Pallas Athena, yes. Kure, the daughter of Zeus, who holds the Aegis. Mm. You know, no, I'm really liking kind of your, your suggestion that the, kind of the whole epic is now bookended with the Andra, and now one of the last words is Pallas Athena. Yeah. Mm. Well, I didn't mention that. I was mentioning it more, mentioning it more thematically. Well, that's, that's kind of, I'm but saying you, that But you've well. developed my argument nicely. Yes. And right. so you get a footnote. It's already there linguistically, right? Correct. Nice. So the translation of, of those last lines in a little bit more as well. So Athena comes down and basically says to the two sides, you've got to make peace because Zeus says you must. Thus Athena, the man obeyed and was glad, and the goddess made both sides swear binding oaths Pallas Athena, daughter of the storm cloud, who looked like Mentor and spoke with his voice. <laughs> so nice. Yeah. So the gods can dress up like other people yep. and come down and surprise you, either with peace or with hardship. That's right. So that's it. We made it to the end. That's it? That's it. Well, let's, um, there's a few more things to talk about before we let this go for, uh, for good. Put it in the can. Put it in the can, exactly. So 
Uh, again, we know from the epic itself, Odysseus' um, wanderings aren't over. He has to do this last act of penance uh, for Poseidon. He has to bring an oar inland so far till he finds the people that don't know what an oar is. They think it's a winnowing fan. Winnowing fan. So he's kind of spreading the gospel of Poseidon mm-hmm. um, in a way. And then he can come back home. And then there were some other traditions that have largely been lost in their epic and dramatic forms, but we know about them. Not, not written by Homer. No, not, not Homeric traditions. But, but the epic cycle, as they call it. Exactly right. So you, there got, was, you got one of those at home in your basement, don't you? An epic cycle, yes. Yeah, it, I hang my laundry on it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you don't hit it every morning at 4.45? That was the and, plan when I brought it home from the, yeah. from the store. But You said to Mrs. Winkle, this is an epic cycle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that's not what happened. That's not what happened. But there's a, 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 an interesting tradition that when Odysseus left Circe's island, she was pregnant with his child. Oh. And so this child is born and grows up there, and Circe names him Telegonus. Telegonus. The one born far away. Oh. Right? As a companion to Telemachus. Telemachus, um, the one fighting far away. Right. And uh, the story goes is that when he reaches manhood, she, Circe, tells her son, Go find your father. Mm-hmm. And he goes off in search, and he, he washes up on the, on the island of Ithaca. Convenient. Thinking that he's somewhere else, though. Ah. And he starts kind of foraging and plundering his way through the island, um, thinking, well, my next stop will be where my father is. But here come Telemachus and Odysseus to neutralize this threat to Ithaca. And tragically, he ends up killing Odysseus unwittingly mm. killing his father. This is so much better than the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Yeah, it's yeah. a good story. It's a good story. Although, then another detail, too, is that when Odysseus dies, Telegonus ends up marrying Penelope in these versions, which is too really, weird. Too weird. Too yeah, weird. We don't want that. We don't want that. But there's also weaved into this that Odysseus also received another oracle that he would be killed at the hands of his son. It's very much like Oedipus and Laius. Maybe um, at some point we can deal with these Odysseic aftermaths is, is yeah. in a future episode. Yeah, I think our listeners would find that really interesting as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, you had some some more from Werner Jager. Right? Yes, I promised this really nice quote as a bookend to this particular episode. So this is from volume one of Jaeger's Paideia, The Ideals of Greek Culture. And he says, this is page nine, Nowadays, we must find it difficult to imagine how entirely public was the conscience of a Greek. In fact, the early Greeks never conceived anything like the personal conscience of modern times. Yet we must strive to recognize that fact before we can comprehend what they meant by honor. Christian sentiment will regard any claim to honor, any self-advancement, as an expression of sinful vanity. The Greeks, however, believed such ambition to be the aspiration of the individual towards that ideal and suprapersonal sphere in which alone he can have real value. Thus it is true in some sense to say that the arete of a hero is completed in his death. Arete exists in mortal man. Arete is mortal man. Hmm, that's great. What do you think that last arete is mortal man? What do you think he's getting at I there? think what he's saying is that human beings were designed for excellence. Ah. They were designed by the gods to be great at things. And the Greeks never let go of that ambition. Hmm. This is why I think contemporary audiences, and I'm shaking my head and scolding them, like the Odyssey better than the Iliad. Because as Bauer says, the Iliad has a higher conception of what it means to be human. The Hmm. Odyssey has a more diminished acceptable conception of what it means to be human. Yeah. I mean, Arete is mortal man. We were designed for excellence, and it doesn't do any good to say, yes, but we have these limitations, we have these flaws and faults, post-lapsarian world. It's all true, but that doesn't do anything to efface the reality that we were designed to be excellent. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, his quote is also a pushback against a, like a contemporary dislike for uh, Odysseus's chest thumping. Right. Like, you know, why is he so boastful? Right. Right. You know, who does this guy think he is? I mean, that's not a, a Greek way of looking at this. Not at all. at all. Right. I am as my colleagues, my peers perceive me. Yes. And he's driven by this honor to reclaim, and he succeeds, as we know, to reclaim his his wife, his son, his home, his father's, you know, future, all of these things. Well, that wraps it up. We are finished with the Odyssey. That's it. On and to, uh, to new things, different things coming yes. up. Yes. So we're going to say thank you to Mishka, a mm-hmm. sound engineer, puts this together. And we're going to say thank you to the gentlemen that provide the music, Mr. Ken Tamplin and Mr. Scott Van Zen. Yes. And before we go, uh, Dave, what would I find if I went to mossmethod.com? If you went to mossmethod.com, yeah. Jeff, I'm sure you go there pretty much every day. I do, but I'm, I'm still puzzled about what I might find there. Really? Yeah. Okay. So you'd find an expert, self-paced, and accessible approach to learning Greek. Ancient Greek, like Homeric, Platonic, also learned to read the New Testament, 
I have this package put together, which will teach you Greek, take you from... Neophyte? To erudite. So check it out. Now, next week, we're going to take a pretty hard turn here, aren't we? Yeah, what are we doing? We're going to skip way ahead. Way, way, way ahead. And we're going from the Greeks to the Romans. To the Roman side. Mm -hmm. We're going to go right down into the first century BC and a man named Sallust. And what are we going to talk about with Sallust? Well, Sallust, we're going to talk about a short portion of his Bellum Catalini, the Catiline's War. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at uh, the view of history that a Roman noble has, namely Sallust, uh, the view of history that he has in the first century BC, his his view of Roman history in particular. So a kind of a literary archaeology, you might say. Fantastic. So listeners, subscribe. Uh, please leave a review on your favorite platform where you listen to this podcast. You can always get in touch with us with questions, suggestions, and complaints. You can write to Dave um, at Dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Or to me, Jeff at adnauseum.com and uh, check out our website. And Dave, you have our gustatory parting shot today. Yes, I do. So this comes from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Hmm. Yeah, from the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. He says, a sandwich and a cup of coffee and then off to violin land where all is sweetness and delicacy and harmony. Now, I don't think he's ever heard me play the violin (laughs) and I don't. But if someone can play the violin really well, oh yeah, it's gorgeous. That's how you get into violin land. Oh yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks. Thanks.